Ain't no sunshine when she's gone It's not warm when she's away Ain't no sunshine when she's gone She's always gone too long Anytime she goes away Wonder this time where she's gone Wonder if she's gone to stay Ain't no sunshine when she's gone And this house just ain't no home Anytime she goes away Hi everyone, so for this week for Crim 210 we're going to be focusing on racism and anti-racism as well as some of the descriptions of why overrepresentation of indigenous persons possibly exists within the justice system, including the youth justice system. We're going to start by looking back at some youth justice policy, and this is some information that you've already been exposed to, but now we're going to begin to think more about whether this policy is actually having an impact on reducing the overrepresentation of Indigenous youth. So when we look at, for example, the Criminal Code of Canada, or if we look at the Youth Criminal Justice Act, we can see different sections meant to try and reduce the overrepresentation of Indigenous persons. So for example, Section 38.2d of the Youth Criminal Justice Act suggests that when judges are considering a sentence, they need to consider for everybody, all alternatives to custody that might be reasonable in the circumstances and that judges must be giving particular attention to the circumstances of Indigenous young persons. So judges are being told when they make their sentencing decisions to consider, for example, the mitigating circumstances such as systemic racism that might warrant a reduced sentence for Indigenous persons. Similarly, if we look at the declaration principle of the YCJ, it again reiterates that it's important to respond to the unique needs of Indigenous persons. And one of these unique needs, or one way to take stock of these unique needs is through a Gladu report, which is also sort of enshrined in the Canadian Criminal Code when we look at sentencing decisions under section 718 2 E. And basically, this is a report that is required to be written typically by a probation officer that will give consideration to the cultural experiences of the First Nations group, for example, that an Indigenous person might come from. So within a Gladu report, typically probation officers will receive specific training, and this training will require them to basically have an understanding of a youth's heritage, a description of some of the systemic or background factors that might be influencing not just involvement in the justice system, but even things like marginalization in other ways, experiences of oppression or poor health outcomes, education outcomes, uh, and so on. And then the report needs to consider how the young person is situated within their community and within their heritage. Unfortunately, what we continue to see today in Canada's criminal justice system is an overrepresentation of Indigenous persons in our court populations. It usually ranges around 25 to 30 percent, and it's sometimes higher in some of the provinces towards the prairies. It's really important not to just memorize the statistic. Yes, you do need to know the statistic, but you need to begin to consider why does this overrepresentation exist? And some of the reasons might have to do with things like also an overrepresentation of a history of experiences of substance abuse or witness to parental substance abuse, witness to forms of violence, exposure to violence, but also concerns that are more systemic. So not just the individual and their experiences, but the experiences of the communities that they are a part of. And this can include things like concerns about over-policing of marginalized groups. Another thing that we've talked about in this class where police will allocate resources to the areas that they perceive to have the highest crime rates. And then as a consequence of that, those groups get over-policed, increasing the likelihood that they're going to be detected for involvement in criminal behavior, whereas other individuals in possibly more affluent communities are less likely to be detected for their involvement in crime. Explanations of overrepresentation aren't just about what is happening today. We need to look back 
at how historical factors have influenced this overrepresentation. When we look at developmental and life course criminology, we know that there's a big emphasis on the intergenerational transmission of different negative social outcomes, including the intergenerational transmission of abuse. But we can also begin to look at things like the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And this goes all the way back to basically colonialism, when we can see the impact of genocide on indigenous persons and the long-term mistreatment of indigenous persons thereafter. We can definitely also see, for example, evidence that offenses by indigenous persons may be more likely to be prosecuted, result in justice system processing. Another reason for overrepresentation could be related to systemic racism, whether it's in communities, police forces, like it's not just a policing issue. We want to take a look at policing, obviously, because that's where we're going to see a big intersection of police and persons involved in crime. But we also have to think about how even just everyday systemic racism can have an influence on involvement in criminal behavior. It's also important to recognize cultural differences, and again, not just cultural differences between indigenous persons and the traditional white European justice system, but also other underrepresented groups, whether it is black, indigenous, other persons of color, there are these cultural differences that can impact how one individual experiences justice system processing. And when you have, for example, in particular com communities or cultures, a great emphasis on community building, the impact of being taken out of that community or feeling like you're no longer part of that community because of your involved in the crime can have a particularly damaging impact on a person's ability to experience rehabilitation. I've expanded on some of these themes in a past lecture I did for CRIM 103, so I'll link it down below for students who are interested in knowing more about the treatment of Indigenous persons. But if we look back to colonization, we can see, and I really recommend you read Bob Joseph's book, 21 Things That You Didn't Know About the Indian Act. Some of the more common things that we will have learned about even going back to high school social studies classes is the impact of colonization on separating indigenous persons from their traditional territories, the infection of indigenous persons with smallpox, the forced assimilation, and the cultural oppression where, for example, the Canadian government banned potlatches from uh, especially it's common for West Coast Indigenous persons where a potlatch is just a ceremony it involves like the bringing of food and ceremonies but dancing the presentation of blankets and other uh, Indigenous artworks and dismantling government structures within Indigenous groups. It's not as if Indigenous groups did not have their own government structures before colonization. They did have their own way of doing things. It was a much more matriarchal society as well. And we can see evidence of this today in Haida Gwaii, for example, when Haida matriarchs basically stood up during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and said that we are shutting off the island from tourism because of the threat that it will pose to the island. So the matriarchs that were responsible for protecting the people of Haida Gwaii. Whereas when the settlement came and colonization came, it was forced assimilation. You have to get rid of these structures. You have to put into power a man who is able to speak English. And then from colonization came the placement of indigenous children in residential schools. And we saw over 150,000 Indigenous youth forcibly removed from their homes. The creation of 130 residential schools that were of extremely poor quality in terms of like just being safe for surviving the winters, but also the abuse that would occur in those facilities, the malnourishment that would occur in those facilities. And this isn't something that has been you know, absent in our lifetime. The last residential school did not close until 1996. And again, the goals of the residential schools were effectively cultural genocide, where indigenous persons were forced to adopt Christian values and would be punished for speaking their own language. And that would involve like very serious physical punishment. And that created kind of a disconnect when they were going back home to their families for holidays, for example, because they would recall the trauma of being brutally beaten for speaking their own language and their parents might not speak English. 
So they didn't want to speak their First Nations language because of the trauma that they had experienced, but then it makes it difficult for them to communicate with their parents who are unable to speak English. One of the big consequences I don't think is talked about as much is the culture of unlearning of parenting skills due to basically the parents having their children ripped from them and then they don't get that opportunity of practicing parenting skills. Moreover, these children who are sent away to residential schools don't get the opportunity to see positive parenting practices at work. So for you sitting at home or wherever you might be, if you have children or if you ever have children, the way that you parent might involve thinking back to how your parents responded to you when you did something well or when you did something wrong. For certain persons, and it's not just indigenous persons, but we could see obviously, especially because of residential schools, these children have had that ability to recall how their parents respond to them in positive ways or negative ways, but the learning of positive parenting practices in order to help perpetuate those positive parenting practices in the future. So if you want to kind of get a sense of the scope of residential schools and how many children were forcibly removed, the Coquitlam population is about 150,000 people. So imagine just like you're driving home from work and you're going through Coquitlam and every single person in that city is completely gone. So imagine how uncomfortable it would feel if you were a person living in that community and all of these children have just been forcibly removed from that community. How difficult and odd it would feel. Within BC, there are about 180,000 children between the ages of one and four. So another way of thinking about it is just imagining basically every single child between ages one and four being removed from the province of British Columbia. And to put some of these residential school experiences into context, when we look at the odds that a child would have died while being placed in a residential school, it was actually higher than the odds of a service member dying uh, while serving for Canada during World War II. When people think about residential schools, they might be more thinking about what was happening during the early 1900s. But this practice of cultural genocide really did continue throughout Canada for quite a long period of time. And some might even argue that it continues to occur. And one of the really big events where we witnessed this cultural genocide was the 1960s, which was what was referred to as the 60s scoop, where about 20,000 indigenous youth were forcibly removed from their homes and sent to live in different foster care facilities, some within Canada, but some all the way down in the United States and some even in Western Europe. So kids who were raised in Canada could be sent all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Their parents would have no idea where they actually were, whether they would actually get to see those children again. When I talked about the intergenerational transmission of different events, this is sort of how that transmission gets perpetuated. So we can see, for example, whether it's residential schools, the sixth scoop, the removal of children from their family, from their culture and their support systems. And this can kind of disrupt cultural, spiritual coping and healing practices, especially when the children are being shamed and punished for trying to practice those cultural or spiritual traditions. And then these children get sent home to parents who are taught sort of the same unhealthy behaviors or taught to experience the same level of shame. And there's that disconnect between children and parents. And then when those children have their own children, we can see this cycle continue. And when we look at how this cycle has perpetuated inequity, we can see it in a lot of these social outcomes amongst Indigenous persons in Canada, where only about two-thirds of Indigenous persons have completed high school compared to about 87% of non-Indigenous persons. We see an overrepresentation of Indigenous persons in foster care, a lower median income, an increased likelihood of experiencing early mortality due to substance use, and a youth suicide rate that's about six times the national average and much, much higher, especially when we look at some of the Northern Territories and none of it. And again, it's so important to contextualize these numbers and why these numbers are so high or so alarming. And it has to do with these social inequities that are still occurring today in terms of 
stereotypes about indigenous persons or systemic racism within different social structures. Neglecting those aspects, just the continued trauma of placement in residential schools or being placed in a foster home as a result of the 60s scoop. These are things that don't just impact the individual, it can impact generations. Regardless of whether it's an indigenous person or any other person, these things are going to have a very big impact on that family's experiences moving forward. Obviously, we've seen a lot of conversations about how to reduce this overrepresentation, and we've seen efforts by police, by the YCJ, by the Canadian Criminal Code. We've seen, for example, attempts to provide a self-administered First Nations police, a attempt to provide culturally appropriate treatment in correctional facilities, the transfer of justice involved persons to Indigenous communities, changes to sentencing practices to give more of a consideration to things like high the principles of law or restore of justice and trying to change the system by changing laws as I mentioned like with the section 38 2d of the youth criminal justice act but these have not really been successful for example it's also very difficult for first nations police to work in the communities that they also live in like think about it if you're living in a community of 1,000 people and everybody knows everybody if you are the police officer that's responsible for policing that community, you can be viewed kind of sometimes with hostility or I grew up in Haida Gwaii and I know for a fact that Haida police officers responsible for policing the First Nations Reserve of Skidigat had a difficult time with this because they would police the people that they're then going to see at the post office the next day. And those people, they might not be hostile, but they won't might also just want to avoid that person. They don't want to be seen in the community because they are aware of other person's business and that person might try to avoid them. So it just makes for a really uncomfortable experience. In Canada, one thing that we maybe didn't talk about as much in this class is the Quebec Act, which allows Quebec to have a lot of say in how it administers its own law. So the YCJ is a federal law and it's on, it's the responsibility of the provinces to enact and enforce the YCJ. But with the Quebec Act, the province of Quebec has a little bit more autonomy in how it makes decisions about the justice system. And based on the Truth and Reconciliation Report, one of the things that we need to begin to think about is instead of changing the system, instead hand the system over to indigenous communities and allow those communities to dictate what they feel is most appropriate. And one of the ways to begin to do this, even if we're not changing the system, is to allow indigenous persons to dictate how we will begin to consider, for example, the treatment needs of indigenous persons involved in the justice system. So the life balance wheel was created by Drs. Louise Clark and Lorna Williams. It's meant to incorporate a holistic assessment and treatment strategy to plan what we would call case planning for Indigenous peoples. And it illustrates how fulfilled a person feels across multiple life dimensions. You can see a whole bunch of different ones here that we'll go through. And it helps to set goals towards achieving greater balance. So we'll zoom in on this slide and give you an example of what the wheel would actually look like. So you can see here, moving from top right down, we have different domains starting with mind and cognition, feelings and emotions, spirituality and life force, and body and physical well-being. The closer to the edge of the wheel, the better those different aspects within those domains are in terms of that person's own sort of self-reported perspective. So when looking at things like life skills, family, healing, uh, wholeness, wellness, honesty, all of these things a person will rate themselves on. And then for example, if you were to look at this particular wheel, you'll see maybe a person reporting deficits in wellness, healing, and in terms of land and nature. So these could be things that the person would want to work on to improve basically their sense of self. So we'll take a look here at the national incarceration rate of Indigenous youth before the YCJ, during like two, that, the last part of the YOA, and then after 2003 during the YCJ. And what we can see here, 
is that there's been a reduction in the rate of incarceration of Indigenous youth post YCJ. So this might seem like a positive thing. However, if we take a look at this slide, what we can see is that when it comes to the reduction in incarceration during the YCGA, the reduction was less substantial for Indigenous persons compared to non-Indigenous persons. So basically what I mean by this is, yes, the rate of incarceration of Indigenous persons drop during the YCJ, but the drop was lower in magnitude compared to the drop for non-Indigenous persons. So, for example, for white youth, the drop in the incarceration rate was much higher compared to the drop for Indigenous youth. So, yes, Indigenous incarceration was being reduced, but we're actually in some ways things got worse because we see an even greater overrepresentation of indigenous youth in custody. And in part because of these findings, some have simply argued that it's time to abolish the system of having a traditional like, white European approach to responding to indigenous persons and instead provide indigenous communities the right to make decisions about the justice system that they will use to prosecute its own members of its own community. So basically when it comes to abolishing the system, while a lot of people are well-intentioned in trying to come up with, like I know a lot of students in this class care about developing ideas for how to improve or excuse me, reduce overrepresentation of indigenous persons, abolishment of the system and returning indigenous rights to indigenous persons allowing them to make their own decisions about the justice system means that persons like myself don't get a say like it's not for me to provide unsolicited advice on how to reduce overrepresentation. it's about giving power back to the persons who want to be able to establish their own laws and so i want to talk a little bit about how risk assessment can lead to the perpetuation of the overrepresentation of indigenous persons and how by not abolishing the system and continuing to do research without thinking about culturally specific responses to youth justice or adult justice system can result in overrepresentation so this particular case is relevant to indigenous persons but the underlying decisions or the underlying result of this case has implications much further than just indigenous communities. It has implications for all persons who might be underrepresented in traditional Canadian research. So that could be black persons, it could be persons from a Southeast Asian origin, it could be persons from China, it could be persons from uh, India, it really doesn't matter. It's the idea that because these persons make up a small proportion of all individuals who are typically included in research, the research findings might not generalize to these particular ethnic or cultural groups. And so in the case of Ewart, originally it was R versus Ewart. Ewart was found guilty of several very serious offenses, including murder, attempted murder, and sexual assault. So again, it's one of these cases where it's hard to kind of begin to maybe feel so much sympathy for the perpetrator of the offense, but the case decision goes much, much further beyond this particular offense. So the Ewart vs. Canada case is where Ewart essentially sued the federal government, specifically the Correctional Service of Canada, and alleged that psychological risk assessment tools were not culturally appropriate for use with Indigenous persons. Essentially, there are a lot of different risk assessment tools used in Canadian correctional systems. In the youth justice system, for example, the Structured Assessment of Violence, Risk, and Youth, aka the SAVERY, is a really commonly used tool. The Psychopathy Checklist Youth version is another assessment tool that's often used. In the adult system, the Psychopathy Checklist Revised is really commonly used to sort of inform broader risk assessment. The PCL family, they're not an, a risk assessment tool per se, but the assessment of psychopathy makes up a large part of risk assessment. So tools like the Historical Clinical Risk 20, aka the HCR 20, relies on the assessment of psychopathy. 
The Violence Risk Assessment Guide, also routinely used, relies on the assessment of psychopathy. And what Ewart was arguing is that the PCLR, and then specifically actuarial risk assessment tools, are not culturally sensitive. So for example, there are like measures like the Static 99, that's a tool designed specifically for persons involved in sex offenses. Another tool, the Violence Risk Assessment Guide that I mentioned, it's another static risk assessment tool, which means that the assessor has to consider only the items that are included in that risk assessment tool in making their decision or basically communicating a person's level of risk. So if I'm the risk assessor and I'm using the violence risk assessment guide, I cannot look at factors outside of the VRAG in communicating to the court what a person's level of risk actually is. And in the Ewart versus Canada case, what his legal team argued was that tools like the VRAG were developed using samples of primarily white male persons in conflict with the law. And because of that, it might not be clear whether these tools are culturally sensitive to indigenous persons or black persons or persons from Southeast Asia. And so basically, there's nothing that the assessor can do to consider cultural distinctions because they are not allowed to deviate from what's included in that risk assessment tool in the first place. And risk assessment tools are really, really important to Canada's justice system. They're used at various stages. They can be used not just for sentencing decisions, but to decide the security rating of persons, whether that person is going to be allowed on a escorted temporary absence from prison, whether the person will be allowed or granted parole. And the court found that Ewart's scores were used in a report prepared for his parole that essentially labeled him as an undue risk to society. My personal opinion is that he probably was an undue risk to society, but we can't just think about Ewart in this case. We have to think about how these tools are being used every single day for effectively every single person in our justice system. And so there might be particular harms to certain persons who might actually be a lower risk and we're failing to recognize that lower risk because the tool is not culturally sensitive to that particular person's background. So back in 2015, the federal court that oversaw the Ewart versus Canada case basically allowed the action against Correctional Services of Canada and deemed that it violated or constituted an unjustified violation of the plaintiffs, that's Ewart's, Section 7 right to life, liberty, and security of the person, so what's enshrined in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and that unjustified point is very key because it's basically suggesting that this violation couldn't be saved by Section 1 of the Charter, which I'm sure you'll all get to learn more about in like Crim 230, 330 classes like that. And someone who was really instrumental in allowing the federal court to reach this decision is Dr. Stephen Hart. I think I've talked about him in this class before when we were talking about the assessment of features of psychopathy. Steve is a faculty member in the psychology department and he testified basically that these tools, these actuarial risk assessment tools, are susceptible to cross-cultural bias or variance, meaning that the reliability and the validity of an assessment tool might vary depending on a person's cultural background. And it's not saying that these tools definitely are biased, but when we look at Correctional Service of Canada's own mandate, Correctional Service of Canada's own principles, it says like one of the main principles is to rely on evidence-based practices. The decisions, the tools that are being used cannot be used unless they've been demonstrated to have reliability and validity. And so what Steve suggested and what the court accepted is the idea that the Correctional Service of Canada failed to establish that these tools definitely did not have bias. So it was incumbent on Correctional Service of Canada to establish that the tools that they were using were appropriate for different cultures and if not, it would be a requirement of CSC to adopt new tools specific to individuals coming from distinct cultural backgrounds. We can begin to imagine 
all the different tools that you might need to create. One for indigenous person, one for black person, but then like black persons don't just consist of a homogenous group. So instead of having all these separate tools for every different cultural group or racial group, what Steve Hart has argued for is basically training of the risk assessors to be able to understand when to bring in the consideration of a person's cultural or background in the assessment of risk. And this is what is referred to as structured professional judgment approach, where the individual doing the assessment can consider factors outside of the items listed on the actual risk assessment tool. So just to reiterate or summarize what Dr. Hart said was that the impugn tools, so the tools that were being raised as potentially not valid or reliable for indigenous persons, were susceptible to cross-cultural bias or variance, and that this variance occurs when the reliability or validity of an assessment tool varies depending on the cultural background of the individual to whom it is applied. So the way the risk assessment tools are typically deemed to be reliable and especially deemed to be valid is the assessment shows that if an individual scores high on this risk assessment tool, it is going to predict a higher probability of recidivism. So that's predictive validity. Reliability is more about the measurement of the risk factors themselves and whether, for example, we have high interrelator reliability, for example. So if I'm one risk assessor and you this person at home, you're another risk assessor, and we're assessing the same person. If we get dramatically different scores for that one person, that's an indication that we lack integrator reliability. It means that there's a lack of reliability for that tool. So if we find that we get a different level of integrator reliability, specifically we have a lower level of integrator reliability, when we apply a tool to indigenous samples compared to white samples, that's a concern with cultural bias. And that's a suggestion or an indication that our tool is going to lead to the types of systemic disadvantage and overrepresentation that we've been talking about in this class. The federal court decision in 2015 was appealed and then went to the Supreme Court of Canada, who basically upheld the decision and suggested that continuing to rely on those tools without ensuring that they're valid to Indigenous persons is a breach of Correctional Service of Canada's obligation to take all reasonable steps to ensure that information about a person is as accurate as possible. It's going back to the idea of evidence-based practices. So ultimately, it also noted that this didn't really infringe on Ewart's rights under Section 7 or Section 15 of the Charter, but it was going to require Correctional Service of Canada to remedy the issue of potential problems with cultural bias in their assessment of risk. And so the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that Correctional Service of Canada must ensure that its policies and programs are appropriate for Indigenous persons and are responsive to their needs and circumstances, as well as circumstances and needs that might differ from a non-Indigenous population. And so the Supreme Court of Canada left it up to Correctional Service of Canada to ensure that they take the necessary steps to update their research. During the Supreme Court of Canada decision-making, there was a release from the Commissioner of Correctional Service of Canada, basically saying that they're already doing all the things that the Supreme Court of Canada has required of them, even before Supreme Court of Canada made that decision. For Correctional Service of Canada to proceed, they need to either identify that the impugned tools are indeed appropriate for use with Indigenous persons, that they're not subject to cross-cultural variants, or if they are, develop other tools or change their assessment practices so that this issue of cross-cultural variants will no longer be an issue and we would no longer, for example, at least in theory, see the systemic differences in justice system decisions across different cultural or ethnic groups.
change themes now and talk about racism towards persons perceived to be from an Asian background during COVID-19 and some anti-racism approaches or steps that can be made to help combat racism towards persons who are Asian or even just persons who are perceived to be Asian. And I'll kind of explain why I'm, I'm making that distinction here. I'll present some research that has shown that Chinese persons have experienced a lot of anti-Asian racism in the past as part of the COVID-19 pandemic, but that this history of anti-Asian racism is not new. It has existed for a long period of time in Canada, especially during the building of the Canadian Railway. Chinese immigrants were treated extremely poorly. They were given the most dangerous jobs. They were forced to pay for their own tools. It was extreme like abuse. There was extremely poor working conditions and those conditions were the worst for persons who were Chinese immigrants. Right here in Vancouver, if you are commuting through Hastings Street, you probably pass by the p &E on the way to SFU. And the p and &E actually has somewhat of a dark past because it was at one point in time used as the site of an internment camp during anti-Japanese sentiments during World War. And so internment camps were created specifically because of suspicions about, I won't just say Japanese persons, but all persons of an Eastern Asian background. When I introduced this topic, I mentioned in our society, there's a tendency to homogenize Asian cultures and refer to a widely different groups of people as under the umbrella term of Asian. So that's another sort of example of racism. Is this, It's not like a really direct or outward form of racism. There's certainly more harmful forms of racism. But as we'll see and kind of begin to learn, these sort of daily forms of racism can be especially harmful to people in terms of like their health, in terms of their ability to sleep at the right times, to be able to be free of stress during their day. Hypersexualization of Asian women has been an ongoing concern as well, especially what we saw um, during the mass shootings in Georgia of women working at massage parlors. And then also stereotypes of Chinese persons and other persons from Eastern Asia as the model minority. Especially in the United States, persons will point to the low rates of criminal behavior among Asian Americans and then simultaneously blame Asian persons for the COVID-19 pandemic and essentially point to Asian persons as a threat to American values. And I, I believe that that also obviously occurs here in Canada as well. And we've seen a lot of videos of it. We've seen men and women assaulted in the downtown east side for their Asian heritage. It's not something that's just confined to the United States. During the COVID-19 pandemic, anti-Asian racism really increased. It escalated during the pandemic. Nearly 2,000 anti-Asian hate crimes were reported over about like an eight week period, March through June of 2020 down in the United States. About 30% of Asian Americans reported more frequent and more serious racial discrimination during the pandemic than before the pandemic. And about 40% of Asian Americans experienced COVID related discrimination during just a one week period. So this could be things like not wanting that person to enter a grocery store or a restaurant cafe solely because of the fact that they were perceived to be Chinese. Some of the common examples of anti-Asian discrimination during the COVID-19 pandemic include verbal harassment and assaults, racial slurs, shaming. We've seen violations of civil rights and discrimination there in the workplace, denial of services from establishments, cyberbullying as another form of racism that I think is maybe going to be even more prominent because of the proliferation of like Facebook groups and on Instagram, everything like that. And young persons are more likely to experience this form of discrimination. Anti-Asian racism during COVID-19 has been characterized by a lot of hypocrisy as well. 
At the beginning of the pandemic, Asian perceived persons were perceived as wearing masks more frequently and therefore were more likely to be labeled as persons who were at a heightened risk of carrying COVID-19, when in reality such persons were being more careful about actually avoiding being sort of diagnosed or catching COVID-19. And then once it was recognized by local governments that wearing a mask was actually important, Asian perceived persons were accused of hoarding masks or accused of sending masks back to China. In the United States, and I, I believe that this is probably true in Canada as well, it's just we don't have the data to support any of these conclusions, but in the United States, anti-Asian hate crimes increased by about 150%, while overall hate crimes in the United States dropped 7% compared to back in 2019. So hate crime was on the decline, yet anti-Asian hate crime was dramatically on the rise. And it's important not to forget that anti-Asian hate crime existed before the pandemic as well. It's not as if the pandemic will disappear and then anti-Asian racism will also disappear. Young persons especially are over accounted for in instances of anti-Asian hate crime. And this is really consequential because one of the outcomes of the experience of racism is long-term damage to health and well-being. And for young persons who are developing, their health and well-being can be especially detrimental on future mental health, future physical health. And so the costs or the consequences are especially dire for young persons. I mentioned health effects and here are some of the ones that Chinese persons and other Asian persons have experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. So depression and anxiety, sleep problems and physical complaints. And this is also not unique to COVID-19 and not unique to anti-Asian racism. Black persons as well have reported experiencing exhaustion from the physical effects of racism in the wake of George Floyd's murder, for example. And that racism extends far beyond police brutality and it sort of seeps into like everyday social structures and that's why it can be particularly damaging because it's this one lingering thing that people have to live with every single day. So the big question is, what do we do about this? What are some effective anti-racism responses? We want to discourage the perpetration of systemic and interpersonal discrimination and simply one of the ways to do so is by offering help and support to victims and reinforce anti-racist norms throughout society. So this sort of permeates throughout society, people begin to understand the impact of even sort of these smaller forms of racism. And Lou et al. 2020 came out with a article to show the different types of anti-racism responses that people can have. And they divided them into reactive bystanding and proactive bystanding. Reactive bystanding is to interrupt or challenge perpetrators before or during the discrimination or even if you're not interrupting that person to go and seek help from authority or other people to provide comfort or support to the victims and speak out against the incidents or perpetrators after the fact. Proactive bystanding is like joining or volunteering for advocacy groups, enhancing someone's own knowledge about discrimination and speaking to others about injustices. These behaviors can help strengthen anti-prejudice social norms to prevent future discrimination from occurring. So here's the part that is problematic. It's not that we don't know how to engage in reactive bystanding or proactive bystanding. The problem is who are the people who are acting as bystanders? So this study by Lu et al. wanted to look at who are the people who are engaging in anti-racism responses? And the answer basically is the people who are experiencing the racism in the first place. So among individuals who witnessed anti-Asian discrimination during COVID-19, about 45% of such persons engaged in anti-racist reactive bystander interventions, which 
to me, I'm actually, I think that's pretty positive about half of people are actually reacting to racism. But the problem is that what we see are that women were more likely to intervene, Asian Americans were more likely to intervene, persons who have experienced racism themselves were more likely to intervene. So for example, individuals who were black, Hispanic, they were more likely to engage in reactive bystander interventions compared to white persons. So women who they can experience racism, not because they're a woman, but because of their racial status, but as a woman, they could also ex have past experiences with sexism or misogyny. And that seems to have increased the likelihood that they are going to intervene or react to racism. Other studies in the United States have found that individuals who have previously experienced some form of victimization were more likely to be a reactive bystander in high-risk situations involving interpersonal violence. So experiences of past victimization for violence increase the likelihood of future intervention or reaction as a bystander. And some of these things to me seem problematic because it's basically showing that the people who are experiencing the racism are the ones that have to stand up to racism. And one of the reasons why this is so problematic is because we know that the experience of racism results in things like depression, anxiety, loss of sleep, physical and other mental health problems. But the response to racism be, by being a reactive bystander, that also puts such persons at risk of maybe a physical assault from the person who's being racist or that person who's being racist turning their attention to the intervener and being racist towards them. So it's the persons that are already being marginalized that are speaking out against racism, being anti-racist, and that's placing them at greater risk. So effectively, what we need to do is figure out strategies to encourage other persons who have not experienced racism in the past to understand how to speak up and intervene, react in order to either stop racism or at least provide comfort to the persons who have experienced racism. What the Lou study also found was that Asian Americans who experienced racism one week or further in the past were highly likely to act as a reactive bystander, but Asian Americans that had experienced racism within that last week were less likely to act as a reactive bystander. And this kind of reiterates this idea that the experience of racism takes its toll on people. It can be demoralizing, distressing, traumatizing, and that might sort of show that there are psychological consequences to racism that impact the person's human agency. Their ability to stand up for others has sort of been reduced because of the draining impact of their own experiences of racism and victimization. So to finish up and to sort of summarize the, the key message here is that white men may need greater levels of training in how to act as a reactive bystander. It's possible that because not experienced these situations in the past, don't necessarily know how to react to them or are not used to this type of confrontation. And so they have greater levels of fear about that confrontation. Whereas persons who have experienced that level of racism in the past are more used to having to deal with these sorts of confrontations, these sorts of conflicts. So what this calls for is maybe even just an acknowledgement that look, Anti-racism can be to intervene, to intercept somebody from being racist, to stop somebody from being racist during that particular event. But if we can't go that far, if we're worried about our own physical safety, for example, it's the showing of support or empathy to the person that ex has experienced that sort of racist attack to at least show them that this is not the norm, this is not what we want for our communities. Maybe it is the norm, but we understand that it shouldn't be. You're welcome in this community. I know that this person just told you not to be in this coffee shop. I disagree with them. Maybe I'll buy you a coffee to show you my support. These are the types of things that maybe we can do to be anti-racist and to help combat racism.
So that's it for this lecture. Hopefully that has been helpful and informative. I know this last part wasn't really about youth in particular, but I think it's such an important topic. It's worthwhile to discuss, even if it doesn't have as clear of a direct connection to course material. That's it. Have a good rest of your week, everybody.